Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Ask the Expert series today. Today, we will be learning about homebrewing with expert Christian Mosbach. I'm Aaron Schachter, GB. GBA host and a beer cider enthusiast. I want to thank everyone who has joined us today, who is joining us today, especially our leadership circle and RLS members. That's Ralph Lowell Society. We appreciate your continued generous support. Before we get started, I would like to introduce a team, the team behind this event. They will be pulling the strings and connecting with you, but you will not see or hear them. First is my colleague, Bailey. She is our event producer. Bailey. Thanks, Aaron. Welcome, everyone. I'm so glad to have you here. Unlike us, you will not be able to hear or see you. Um, thanks for joining us, and we hope you enjoy our homebrewing event. Thank you so much. All right, we also have Abby. She is going to be hanging out in the Q&A section. Abby? Hi, welcome everyone. Thanks, Erin. We want to hear from you. So open up that Q&A tab. Let us know your questions and your comments. Also, let us know where you're joining us from. See something that you want to hear asked? Vote for it by clicking thumbs up. All right, thank you. And as I said, joining us is Christian Mosbach. Without further ado, it is my in pleasure to introduce our expert brewer today. Great Christian to be here. is, thank you, Christian. Christian grew up in the Philadelphia area, but we won't hold that against him. He currently lives in Watertown, so that's good enough. He has brewed professionally for over 14 years, from small brew pubs to large production breweries. For six years, he worked at Golden Avalanche Brewing. That's in Cutstown, Pennsylvania, where he attended Cutstown University of Pennsylvania. And he moved on to a brewery called Weyerbacher, which makes spectacular stuff. That is in Easton, Pennsylvania. He was there for another five years before making the move up here to Massachusetts. He is currently the director of brewing operations for Hopsters Brewing Company with locations in Newton and Boston. Christian has won numerous awards in various home brewing competitions and is also a BJCP certified beer judge. We'll get to that. And a Cicerone certified beer server. So, Christian, I get to start with a few questions. The first one is, what do those titles mean? They sound kind of fancy. Yeah, so um, let's start with the Cicerone program. Um, they have multiple levels of um, uh, beer knowledge. So you start off as a, uh, a certified beer server, then you have a certified Cicerone, and it's sort of like the wine sommelier program, just for beer. So I just did the lowest level right now, um, thinking about working my way up. Um, also the BJCP, that is the Beer Judge Certification Program that trains judges uh, to judge beer competitions. It could be all the way from homebrew competitions to the World Beer Cup, Great American Beer Festival. Uh, so it really just makes sure that these people actually know what they're talking about. That sounds like one of those tough job, but somebody has to do it sort of thing. Somebody has to do it. That's right. <laughs> oh, poor Christian drinking beer all day. The best beer in the world, right? Sometimes. Sometimes, yeah. <laughs> um, so let, let's start. We, we are here to talk about home brewing. And I actually, I mean, this is probably not a question I should ask you, but I've always wondered why. With, with guys like you out there, especially now, right, in, in this day and age of craft beer, with so much incredible beer out there, why take the time to do it at home? Well, to do it at home, you can, first off, uh, customize your beer however you want. Um, so you can use any sort of malt you wanted, any, you know, you might not be able to find these things commercially, so uh, you really get to customize the beer that you want to make. You can make it for special events or, you know, just your everyday drinking. Uh, it's a fun hobby. You know, if you, uh, on a Saturday, you fire up the kettle, start mashing in on Saturday morning by noontime, you know, you're have a couple friends over, you're cracking beers and, you know, it's, it's a real good um, hobby that you can do with other people. Did you say you can make the beer in one day? You can brew the beer in one day. 
uh, then it has to ferment for anywhere between seven days to 28 days for lagers. Um, but brewing the actual beer, that's the hard part, takes about, you know, six, seven hours. And is there any way, um, again, I know these are simplistic questions, but um, is there any way to know as you go along um, what you've got? Or is it just uh, yeah, so you, you, can, you, you, you just see at the end? Um, you can pull samples as you're going along, you know, as long as you keep everything sanitary, you could pull a sample out of your fermenter, taste it as it's going along. That's kind of good to do. You can taste uh, your unfermented beer right when you start. You could taste it halfway through. You can taste it at the end and you could see how it progresses during that whole process. It'll go from sweeter to drier. And then if you add dry hops, then, you know, you get a more hop uh, forward uh, flavor profile coming out of that. And what is what is your favorite um, beer these days? I mean, it, it, for a period of time, it was the hoppier, the better, right? And oh, yeah. we, we may be fading a little bit from that. And now it seems the juice, the more juicy it is, the better. Where, where do things stand for you and the industry? Uh, I think for consumers, um, a lot of what we're making these days is, you know, the very uh, juice forward, New England uh, hazy IPAs. Uh, that's we're making a lot of those these days. Um, me personally, um, I like a nice German Hefeweizen. Uh, I've been drinking a lot of uh, Oktoberfest right now. It's that time of year, so uh, yeah. I like the German styles. Huh. Okay. The the um, are those the easiest to make if. Um for people doing it at home the german styles say, um the lagers are a little bit tougher because especially if you do a lighter lager um there's not a whole lot of flavor to you know if you make a mistake somewhere along the way you're not <laughs> just yep. dosing it with hops so any sort right. of off flavor that may be present uh it's going to be pretty obvious whereas if you have a uh, a big west coast ipa that's just packed with you know, hot bitterness and, you know, yeah. pine and resin, uh, you know, you might be able to get away with, uh, you know, a little uh, off flavor. Is that what you recommend people start with kind of a West coast IPA? Yeah. West coast IPA, IPAs in general, um, pale ales. Um, if you could also do, um, some stouts that, you know, or maybe a fruit beer, those are pretty good to start with as well. Because if you do make any sort of mistake, there's some uh, other flavors present that may, you know, mask it, the problem. Yeah, ma mask it. Yeah, <laughs> it, it's it's still salvageable. All right, I, I, I want to remind people that at the bottom of your screen there is a uh, Q and A tab, and you can uh, ask questions of Christian. And we will uh, start with one here from Chris and Chris in South Brookline. Um, there has been, uh, Chris and Chris are suggesting there's an uptick in home brewing, likely because of the pandemic, just as there's been an uptick in bread making and cooking and all sorts of things. Um, is there any way, do you know, to quantify that? What, what has happened in the last six, seven months? I would say if you were a homebrew shop, you could probably tell from your sales. Um, as an average consumer, might be a little bit tougher. Uh, <laughs> you know, try and figure that out. Um, I'm not sure if they're doing competitions right now, but if you saw an increase in the number of entries coming in, that might suggest that maybe, you know, more people are brewing uh, and then entering these beers in competition, but without like the actual sales data, I'm not really sure how you would, uh, you know, quantify that. Are you guys having trouble finding hops or anything like that? I mean, clearly you can't tell whether that's a homebrew situation, but I do wonder <laughs> the, the common wisdom is that a lot more beer is being drunk right now. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. We're, yeah. We're, we're brewing more beer than we ever have uh, with our hops. Most of them are contracted. So uh, we don't really have to worry about, you know, a lot of, you know, the hops we use the most because uh, we contracted those out last year. Um, David is in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Thanks, David, for tuning in. He is originally from Philly. Um, he's asking, what is the best way to get started? Uh, well, I was going to say, if you're in the Boston area, you could always come in the Hopsters and, uh, you know, right. uh, we have, we have kettles, small kettles. You can come in and brew your own beer with us. 
Um, but if you are saying Halifax, Nova Scotia, I would yeah. recommend uh, go visiting your local homebrew shop. They could probably set you up with a um, some a cost effective option because you know you can start off pretty basic, but you can also spend a lot of money getting into this. Like I started out with a plastic bucket and a little, you know, five gallon stock pot that went on my oven. And then you could also move up to more expensive, you could spend thousands of dollars on this. So, but I would just recommend going to your local homebrew shop. And if you're unsure about getting into it, then they could probably steer you in the right direction. And and you can start with a kit that way, right? Yeah, yeah, you can start with uh, pre-made kits um, to get you going. And then once you sort of, uh, figure out what you're doing, then you can start making your own recipes. So, uh, but you can start off pretty easy just by buying a kit. They usually have them pre-made uh, in the homebrew shop. So someone who, uh, as, as you started to say, someone in Boston who wants to start um, with you guys at Hopsters, uh, where do they go? Which location and how does that work? Yep, so uh, that, uh, the brewing on the kettles will be in our Boston Seaport location. And you can book an appointment at our website, which is www.hopstersbrew.com. And you just set up your brew appointment. And then after your brew appointment, we will ferment the beer, transfer it into a keg. And then you will come back uh, to schedule a bottling session and you'll bottle about three cases of beer and leave with three cases of beer. And, and we pick from a recipe that you have. We have a whole book of uh, you know recipes ready to go, but if you're comfortable, if you want to make your own beer, uh, you know we can work with you on that. You can change up the malt, the hops. Uh, if you want to get a different yeast strain, you know we can work with you on that. So be, it's uh, end of October now. Is there still time to make beer as holiday presents? Absolutely. Yeah, you could come in. Uh, probably, I'd say within the next three weeks, but. By the end of November, uh, you could have your beer ready, ready to go by Christmas. Oh, sounds nice. Um, I, I know you said you um, you contract out for most of your supplies, but um, we have a one of the folks attending asking if you ever grow your own hops. Uh, back in Pennsylvania, I did. I had about uh, six plants. Uh, they were Cascade. Um, I did have my setup. I built a uh, six foot trellis, and then. Uh, it was a lot of work, uh, but you know, for, I, you maybe get like a pound or two of hops and it's a lot of work for something that costs like eight bucks a pound, but you know, <laughs> it is nice. It is nice to make your own fresh hop beer. Uh, you know, once the end of the summer comes around, uh, it's not that hard to grow. You just have to, you know, water it, give it nutrients, full sun, and you'll be good to go. Does it taste better? You know, kind of like growing your own tomatoes often almost always taste better than the supermarket. Does your own hops taste any different? Yeah, they are fresher because they're not processed. I, when I grew them, I would use them right away, but um, occasionally I would uh, vacuum seal them and then throw them in the freezer and then use them at a later date. Uh, normally when you buy commercial hops, they're pelletized. So they run through a machine that turns them, it looks like rabbit food. Uh, for brewers, you know, it's easy for us to use because every, you know, it's a consistent size. You don't have to deal with all the right. plant, you know, matter clogging everything up. But there's something really nice about fresh whole cone hops. Okay, we have a couple um, technical-ish questions, so we'll we'll have that from Robert. Uh, Robert says, "I have a wort chiller, but can't seem to reduce temperature below 80 degrees in less than 90 minutes." I actually like some haze to my beer. Should I worry about quick cooling? Should I immerse the wart chiller in an ice bath? So two things. One, tell us what wart is for those of us who don't know, and then we'll answer Robert's question. So wart is what you make when you actually brew. It's unfermented beer. So uh, when what he's talking about with the wart chiller, you're taking your um, boiling temperature wart, and then you want to reduce it down to about 68 to 70 degrees uh, and then you want to put your yeast in because uh, otherwise you would kill the yeast if you put it in right away. Now he's talking about reducing uh, the temperature. Now if he's using a pump I would say you can either slow down your pump and increase your water going through because you'll have wort going through one way and 
cold water going through the other. So uh, the heat transfers from the wart to the water going the other way. And then usually it goes down the drain or if you have some sort of recirculation setup, I would say you can either slow down your wart going the one way and then um, run your water going at full blast or ice bath is always good as well. Um, but I would recommend trying to get uh, that wart chilled down as quickly as possible. Okay. And a uh, question from Elizabeth, uh, for bottle conditioning, do you have recommendations for pasteurizing? I have some hard cider carbonating right now, and I'm wondering if I can just let the sugars run out or if I should stop the yeast action. Uh, for bottling conditioning, uh, for those that don't know, that is a form of uh, natural carbonation that happens in the bottle. So you would take your finished product, you would add a little bit more yeast and sugar, and then package it, and then that will re-ferment inside the package. And since it has nowhere to go, it will naturally carbonate uh, the beer inside. Um, now for she hard cider, um, I would recommend your hard cider, getting that down the terminal gravity, which means it's done fermenting. And then I would add more sugar and yeast. Um, I wouldn't worry about pasteurizing it. Um, if you wanted it more of a sweet cider, um, you can add certain things into it. Um, yeah, uh, that, that would stop fermentation, but then that might also kill your bottle conditioning yeast. But I, I would recommend letting it, let the thing ferment out and then, because if you leave any residual sugar and it re-ferments, you could risk bottles exploding and nobody wants that. Um, someone asks, speaking about yeast, that there are several varieties available. How do you decide uh, which ones to use? So it uh, depends what my base beer, you know, what am I going to be making? If I'm making a New England IPA, hazy IPA, um, a very popular yeast is, uh, it's called London Ale. Uh, three is this particular type. Um, so that will leave a little bit more body uh, versus something like an American ale yeast, which will ferment a little bit drier. Uh, if you wanted to brew wheat beers, um, you could use like a Hefeweizen ale strain that will produce flavors of banana and clove. You could use Belgian um, Abbey yeast that can tend to produce uh, hints of banana and will also tolerate very high ABVs like in your Belgian triples. Mm. But it really just depends on what beer you're actually trying to make. Well, here, here's a question. That, that question was from Dave. Um, this is a question from Lynn. Um, I like sour beers. Uh, can you talk about the brewing process that makes a sour beer? Okay, so you can make sour beers. Um, I'm going to talk about, you can do kettle souring, and then you can talk about... Um, you know, fermenting with traditional bacteria. Um, the traditional way you would add, you know, you would make your base beer, put it into some sort of oak container or a tank, and then you would pitch uh, certain types of bacteria, probably um, lactobacillus that will produce lactic acid, uh, some acetobacter that will produce a little bit of uh, acetic acid. Um, and that usually takes about a year or so that's how you traditionally make um, sour beers. Now what's becoming popular these days is kettle souring. So basically uh, you would make your beer like you normally would uh, in your boil kettle or wherever, you would reduce the temperature down to about 115 and then you would pitch your lactobacillus bacteria and then you just let it naturally sour over the course of like three to five days. So you get a pH drop and then I, we do it in our kettle, why it's called kettle sour. Then you just turn the steam on and then treat it like a regular beer. That will kill the bacteria so you don't infect everything in your brewery, uh, but you get all the benefits of the pH drop. So you get a, a, a shelf stable, uh, ready to go sour beer. Uh, and that's pretty popular these days with uh, American brewers. Yeah. Lynn, thank you for your question. And uh, we do want to remind folks out there uh, watching that you can ask questions. There's the uh, Q&A tab down there at the bottom of uh, the, uh, the Zoom screen. You can ask a question and we will, of course, try to get to that. We have another question from Luke, who's asking um, what books 
on brewing you might recommend for a beginner for someone who isn't going to go to hopsters uh, or not yet anyway and uh, what tips might you give beginners to avoid sort of common beginner mistakes yeah so a couple books i would recommend getting um how to brew by john palmer i think that's uh, an essential book in any home brewers uh library Another one, if you want to really get started, but don't really know where to start with recipes, um, Brewing Classic Styles is a, a great book. And then if you want to learn how to design recipes, Designing Great Beers, that's another great book. Um, so I would start with How to Brew. That'll get you everything you need to know. And then the other two books are uh, really just sort of uh, once you kind of know what you're doing already. Now, New to home brewing. Okay, so they want some tips now to get started. Um, I would say you want to get a good boil going because if you don't, if you just simmer it, uh, you're not going to get a good, you know, flavor out of it. Um, I would recommend cooling it down as quickly as you can. Um, I know not every home brewer can do this when they start, but um, it's not very expensive. But it's a little oxygen stone, so it's a little piece of metal with very small holes in it. And then you get a little oxygen cellar cylinder like Home Depot or something. And it's just something for the yeast to eat. Uh, it's a nutrient for yeast and it'll really prevent you from having, you know, any sort of off flavors. Uh, and one last thing, if you can keep the temperature stable, so uh, you can, the easiest way, uh, put your fermenter in just a giant bucket of water and that'll sort of act as like a thermal barrier. So your temperature won't get too hot. It'll keep it more of a uh, stable temperature. We, we have a, a question related uh, from Steve in Westminster. He says he is new to home brewing as a hobby. He's done three batches so far, all successful, which is great. Uh, using, I think, kind of what how you started with basic equipment, a regular kettle and brew bucket. He's asking what the next purchase should be to improve his setup. Um, the next purchase that, yeah, it's not that expensive would be an oxygen stone. You know, it's maybe 30 bucks or something like that, but, um, that would be the first step to make. Yeah. And that would, yeah. Oxygen stone would be the next purchase I would recommend. And then after that, if he could get a temperature controller and some sort of small refrigerator or chest freezer, you can really dial in your temperature within like one degree. So I, those two things I think will take your home brew from like pretty good to like really good. Huh. That seems pretty good. Um, all right. We have another question, uh, an anonymous question. I love English brown ales. How easy is it to brew these? And, and do you have any tips? Yeah, it's not, it's not that different than brewing any other beer. Uh, just make sure you're using um, English ingredients. So, um, when you go to the homebrew shop, just make sure you're getting, uh, you know, some sort of English base malt, English, you know, crystal malts and specialty malts, um, and then an English yeast. So I think English yeast will contribute a lot more flavor than if you just use some sort of neutral American yeast. Okay. Uh, Jim from Brighton is asking, when I brewed in the past, I've done the boil with a portion of the water and then diluted it with fresh cold water, which also reduced the temperature. I, I think I already know the answer to this one. How strongly do you recommend a wart chiller to bring the temp down? It's something he'd have to buy. Yeah, um, that's one way to do it. So you brew a, a, um, a stronger beer than what you're looking for, and then you dilute it with cold water. That will both drop the, um, the uh, gravity of the beer down, but it also chill it. Um, I would recommend getting a wort chiller and just brewing your, you know, your standard, you know, how you want your beer to turn out versus diluting it with water. I, I would definitely recommend a wort chiller. You can get um, anywhere. It's a, called an immersion chiller. It's basically a coil, you know, a piece of copper coil and you just run cold water through it and those aren't that expensive. You can make your own. If you want to get more fancy with it, you can get a, a plate heat exchanger and a pump, um, but that's a bit more expensive. To, eventually, do you need to devote a whole room of your house to this? 
not necessarily a whole room, maybe the corner of your basement or something. It, all this stuff, you know, depending on what size system, if you just have a basic system, most of this stuff packs up very smallly. You're not doing it in your bathtub. No, no, no. <laughs> I, I would, re I would, yeah, I would recommend doing that. You can do it in your kitchen, but uh, if you get a boil over, then it goes all over your oven. It's just easier to do it outside. Okay. If you can. Um, I just want to remind everyone that uh, you can ask Christian a question. There is a Q&A tab at the bottom of uh, the Zoom screen. Just type it in there and we will get to that question. Um, a few more. Uh, is it okay to add cold water to the hot wort once the boil is finished to reduce the temp quicker and to adjust the original gravity to get a higher ABV? Yeah, I think that's uh, kind of what we talked about a little bit in the last question about uh, making a higher strength beer and then diluting it down. Um, right. that, that is one way to do it. Um, I personally would recommend uh, an immersion chiller or some sort of uh, cooling device. You can even take your boil kettle and, you know, if you have uh, some sort of container where you could put ice and water in there and then just stir it. Um, that's another, you know, put in your sink and just stir it. That'll, that's also a, a little bit more cost effective way to, uh, you know, cool it down quickly. I, I, I know you said you can, you can start small and go up to thousands of dollars, but if you really want to jump into it relatively quickly, what is a what is a package um, cost that you know to be relatively comfortable that the beer you make will come out the way you want it? Sure. So first off, uh, depends if you want to. Let's just say if you're just starting off, you're going to use a malt extract with some specialty grains. Um, you could just pour your malt extract in uh, in your boil kettle, steep your specialty grains. Uh, so you'll just need some sort of uh, kettle to boil everything. You might have that already. Um, most batches are standard at about five gallons. So you would need at least something, maybe a six gallon, six and a half gallon pot uh, to boil this stuff in. Um, you could buy one for 50, 60 bucks if you find a good deal. Um, if you don't have one already, that would be your first step. And then You'll need some sort of fermenter to ferment it in. Um, you can do what's called a, um, it's basically a plastic bucket with a little spigot on the bottom. So you can ferment in that, that's maybe 20 something dollars. And then you can uh, bottle straight off of it. So that's probably the cheapest way to get into it. So I'm saying you could probably get in for under a hundred dollars. Mm. That's not bad. Um we, we have a question here. Uh, what is the difference between brewing beer and making cider other than obviously the ingredients? What the difference in the process? Um, so I've only made cider once. Um, so with cider, you basically uh, get your apple juice, uh, fresh press, uh, preferable, but um, you don't have to go through the whole brewing process for that you would just have to uh, get it in some sort of, uh, in your kettle. You wanna raise that to about 160 degrees or so, that will pasteurize it. And then you wanna cool that back down. Um, at 160, you probably also wanna add some yeast nutrients cause apple cider by itself probably doesn't have all the essential nutrients that yeast would need to uh, go through the fermentation process. And then you wanna cool that down your temperature and then just put your yeast in so really you could be done in half an hour or so under an hour Ooh. versus That's six a... seven hours versus the, going through the whole brewing process from mashing in to running off to the kettle boiling cooling down clean up it's a quicker process you just have to wait longer generally ah okay the process is quicker but the wait is longer yeah yeah Okay. Uh, we are talking with Christian Mosbach. He is the brewer at Hopsters. They have two locations, one in Newton and the other in the Boston Seaport. And we've got lots of great questions, still more uh, to come. But before that, um, I'd like to take just a moment to introduce my colleague, Sarah. Sarah, welcome. Thanks, Aaron. And thanks, Christian. And hi, everyone. Thanks so much for spending an hour of your time with us during today's Ask the Expert event. 
I, like many of you, am a beer enthusiast, and I feel like I'm learning so much about home brewing so far. I've never actually tried it, but now I feel like I kind of almost want to. Um, GBH offers a wide variety of events made possible thanks to people like you who care about the work that we do. If you haven't already, we encourage you to become a sustaining member or make a donation. Today, when you make a gift of $5 a month on our sustainer plan, you can choose to receive this now vintage WGBH 897 mm -hmm. Pilsner glass with the W. You can enjoy lagers, <laughs> ales, and of course, Pilsners in the glass as a thank you gift. Now more than ever, it's crucial to stay informed of what is happening in the world. And your backing helps us provide information you can trust along with events you can enjoy. Show you're a fan of GBH and public media when you pull out this 89.7 Pilsner glass and in the process, help us to continue to produce content like Axe the Expert. You can give $5 a month or $6 all at once, whatever works for you. Please go to wgbh.org slash support event. And to make it super easy for you, just click on the link that just popped up in the chat and contribute what you can. Anyways, thanks again for joining us. And now back to Aaron. Thanks, Sarah, for uh, dropping in. And the uh, the glasses, as she said, are a classic because they still have that W, which we have since we have since lost. Um, but that that uh, nice little perk there uh, for sixty dollars a year brings up a question for me. Can we see this on Zoom? There's a glass, right? That's the glass that uh, Sarah just held up. This is another one. I don't know if I should be advertising the different breweries here. And this is another one. What is with the glasses these days? You can't just buy beer anymore. You, you, you worry about what hop is in it. You worry about what glass you put it in it. You put it in. D does the glass really matter? I mean, they look cool. Yeah, yeah. Glass, uh, the glassware can make a, uh, a difference depending how it's shaped. Uh, you know, certain... Um, for like a high ABV beer, you want a uh, more of a snifter glass um, that will sort of, uh, you know, it's it's more like drinking a cordial. You know, if you're drinking a Belgian quad, you know, you don't want to drink it out of a pint glass. Uh, certain things like um, like a vice beer vase, it sort of tapers to the top, so when you pour it, it gives you a nice thick head on there. Uh -huh. uh, you have you have certain proprietary glasses. I think that's uh, right. I, I think it was. Yep, something like uh, the Sam Sam Adams, I think, made one uh, where they had laser etching on the bottom of the glass. So when you pour a beer in, it's actually a um, nucleation site to create bubbles, and it would theoretically create a uh, thicker head. So these that, you know, that's these just for looks, right? That does that change the taste, or is that just a? I mean, it's, it's always cool to have the vice beer with the nice head and the lemon in it if that's what you're into. But but that's just for looks, right? It can be for looks. Uh, some argue you can get a different sort of, uh, however minute it may be, some sort of uh, flavor difference. But um, you know, presentation is everything. So you want your beer to look the best. <laughs> you don't want everything served in a uh, you know shaker pint glass. Is that is that actually bad? Are you losing something? Um, you know, across the spectrum of beers, if you are just using the shaker pint glass. I mean, I guess it's fine if you're drinking, you know, your, your, your mainstream lagers, but, uh, you know, it's not, it's not the appropriate glassware for the style, but you know, it's, it's fine, but, uh, I, you know, I'm a stickler for presentation. So, uh, yeah, the way you say it doesn't I, sound I, fine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I, I, I have probably too much, uh, beer glassware for every type of beer. So, uh, yeah, I, yeah, I'm a stickler for it, so. But it's fine. Uh, it's fine. Use the pint glass. It's fine. Yeah, <laughs> but don't really you, <laughs> use use whatever works for you. <laughs> right. Any glass is better than no glass, if that's your a option. Absolutely, absolutely. Don't drink it out of the bottle. Okay. Um, Let's get back to questions. We got more um, flooding in here on our Q and A uh, tab. Uh, is it okay to add cold water to the hot wort once the boil is finished to reduce the temp quicker? Oh no, we did that one. Never mind. Um, this is from Dave, who's asking about um, the aerator you mentioned. Uh, he says he usually aerates by pouring back and forth. Um, does he really need uh, that thirty dollar device that you were talking about? 
Uh, yeah, for oh. a while, that's how, uh, before I got my little oxygen stone, I used to pour it back and forth. Um, so what that does, and you do it slowly, so you want to make it splash a lot. So that'll get the uh, oxygen sort of to absorb uh, into the warp. Uh, you will pick up, um, you will get some oxygen saturated into your wart that way. You just won't get as much. So um, certain beer styles, like your higher ABV beers, the yeast requires a higher level of oxygen. So you might not get the parts per million of dissolved oxygen um, pouring it back and forth and you might get with a, uh, an oxygen stone. But um, I used to do the pouring back and forth in a while and it, wor it worked pretty good, so. So your answer to Dave there is the same as with the glass. You can do it, but maybe not the yeah. best way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you can do it. I did it for years and then uh, got an oxygen stone and takes about 30 seconds and then you're done. And then uh, your beer turns out a lot better. All right, Dave, there you go. Um, Mary has had this question for quite a while. I want to make sure to get this out there. She says, I discovered Radlers over the summer. How do you make that type? of beer yeah so uh radler is basically a um it's basically lemonade and beer so you could make a hefeweizen german hefeweizen recipe and then you could um tra traditionally you would just blend it with lemonade so you can either make the beer and then do a 50 50 pour or however strong you want it um or right before you bottle your beer or keg your beer pour it in with the beer and then package it um, it's really that simple. Any particular lemonade you should use? I've never used a, uh, I've never, I've never made a Rattler, but, uh, you know, um, maybe a country time lemonade. I'm not really yeah, sure. Okay. I just wondered if there's a thing. Um, Brian is asking what your perspective is of uh, boil on bag for small batches, like a gallon at a time. So uh, I think, is that the brew in a bag? I think that's brew in yeah, a bag. So bag. basically um, you would, in your boil kettle, you would put your grains and everything in and then you would mash in your beer. So uh, maybe at about 150 degrees, um, that's where you would want your uh, water to be at. And then when you put the grains in, that's how most professional brewers, when we mash in uh, at 150, all the starches in the grain, uh, there's enzymes in there that break down the starches and the sugars. And then that's what we want. Um, that's what the yeast wants to make beer. So with brew in a bag, everything is in a self-contained bag. And then after your hour mash in, you would lift it up and then pour your water over to, to uh, rinse any remaining sugars. Um, and then you would continue to boil as normal. Um, I've never personally done it, but it seems like, um, yeah, like you were saying, probably that'd probably be pretty good for small batch experimentation. Right. You, you talked at the beginning about sort of the, the work versus the return. Um, yeah. Does the bag make it easier? I mean, it must, right? Because yep, all, cause all the grains Everything are in the bag. So yeah. once you're done with it, you just pull it out and throw it out or put the grains somewhere, maybe compost them if you can. Um, I think you can rinse the bags a couple of times, reuse them a couple of times. So it's really simple. You just pull it out and you're done. Okay. Uh, we got Dave from Norwood uh, is asking how much and how often should you stir the boil? The only time I would recommend stirring, like once, once you're boiling um, and you get a good simmer, good rolling boil, you don't really need to touch it. It's going to turn by itself inside the kettle. The only time I would recommend um, would once you're done boiling, take your spoon and stir it around. That'll create a whirlpool effect and any proteins and any hot material will sort of settle into the middle of your kettle. And then, um, you, then you would transfer the wort from an outside portion so you don't suck up all that protein and shrub. Um, professional breweries do this. Uh, you know, it won't clog up your heat exchanger. It'll make a cleaner beer. Uh, that would be the only time I would really recommend seeing, unless you're adding like, some sort of uh, fruit syrup or, you know, a sugar or something. Um, you could stir it in then, but you really shouldn't have to uh, stir it otherwise. Okay. Um, this is uh, from Robert. 
um, and I hope I get this right, when using oxygen absorbing bottle caps, why doesn't sanitizing activate the bottle caps? Do you think that is a gimmick? Um, depends what you're using for uh, your sanitizer, I guess. Uh, if you're using um, like an iodine solution, uh, that's a pretty popular uh, home brewing uh, sanitizer. Um, that won't activate the uh, oxygen caps. Um, I don't really know a lot of home brewers using uh, parasitic acid. That's what we use in professional breweries. Um, I don't know if you can actually get that as a uh, cons consumer. So um, I guess it really depends on what um, you're using as your sanitizer. I'm not really sure about the science um, behind how they actually scavenge the oxygen out of your bottle. Okay. Um, here's a question that I, I've been dying to ask you actually myself from Anonymous. Do you have a favorite beer of all time? You've tried them right from all over the world, all over the country. Can you pick a favorite? Oh man, the best beer I've ever had. Uh, I was in Munich and uh, we went to um, an Augustiner uh, beer hall and they had a fresh, um, it was a wooden cask and they just tapped it fresh there. It was their Hellas. And that was the most delicious beer I've ever had. Wow. Augustiner is a, is a um, it's, it's not a craft beer. It's a big company. Oh, right? no, no. Oh yeah. But it's, they're massive. You know, that was, yep. But That's really fresh. interesting. Yeah. And I've, you know, I, like I said earlier, I like the German style. So I, you know, drink a uh, Hellas beer anytime I go to a brewery. Uh, nothing, nothing will, you know, that's sort of set the bar for, you know, what I want in my uh, Hellas beer. That's, that's interesting with all these crazy different IPAs. I was going to actually say possibly your, I don't know if you made this yourself, but the uh, blithering idiot from Weyerbacher, which is a barley wine ale, right? Is oh, yeah. quite spectacular. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I made my fair share of that. Yep. Uh, you should try the uh, barrel aged version. Oh, it's I don't dangerous. know if you can get that in Massachusetts, but yeah, uh, next not. time I'm in Pennsylvania. Um, there we go. Here, here's the classic question. Uh, what about serving temperature in British pubs? Of course, it's always said to be room temperature. It's not really. It's a cellar temperature, but um, yeah. you know, it's what, 50 ish degrees, some 55 degrees, something like that. But, yep. you know, in America, they give you a glass that comes out of a, uh, a cooler. Um, what is your preference and, and does it actually vary according to beer types? Is one right or wrong, I guess? Uh, well, it does vary according to beer types. Um, yeah, your, your uh, English beers, you want to serve at, uh, you, know, thir you know, 50 degrees. Um, Lagers, you know, I, I usually like to drink those at about 40, maybe 45 degrees, you know, cold, but not as cold as the Rockies. Um, <laughs> your high ABV beers, you know, I always recommend, you know, pour a nose into a snifter glass, let it warm up a little bit. Um, the idea is when it's warmer, uh, the flavors will come out a little bit more. When it's cold, those flavors uh, sort of stay in the solution. Um, when it when it warms up a little bit, the CO two comes out of the solution of the beer, and it you know brings out the uh, flavors and aromas of the beer. Well, maybe there's some method to that madness of of the Rockies beer being as cold as humanly possible. <laughs> hide it, hide, hide if there's it no flavor to mask. There. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, that was so snobby. I'm sorry. Uh, there is a question here from John. What do you think about the Pico brew machine brewing kit? Uh, that seemed like a cool idea. The, the Pico brew machine. Um, so you would basically get little containers, fill them with uh, malt hops. Uh, you would fill a water container and it would basically do the whole brewing process itself. So it would mash in the grains, uh, transfer them, boil them for you chill it down and then you would basically uh, just run off in your fermenter. Um, I always wanted to try one, but uh, they were a bit pricey, several thousands of dollars. And 
huh. I think they might have. I'm not sure. Uh, they might have gone out of business. I'm not, I haven't really kept up with it. Seemed like a cool idea, though. Um, okay, let, let's get a few more questions. To get through. Uh, Michael is asking, what is the best way to filter the wart? So, uh, if you want to filter the wart, um, I'd say the best way um, in your boil, you want to use something called a uh, whirl flock. Um, it's also called Irish moss. Uh, I think the whirl flock um, comes in little tablets and uh, basically it's a kettle co coagulant. So when you mix it in, it, um, it'll it grab like the proteins and stuff and it'll, you know, bind to them and then form a little blob in the bottle, in the bottom of your kettle, and then you just rack off around it. So that's one way to clarify your wart. Um, if you really wanted to, at, you know, after that, I would say if you wanted to strain it, you, you could strain it through a coffee filter. Uh, but I think if you did the whirl flock and did a whirlpool, like I said, where you stir it and then let it settle for about 20 minutes, uh, that's probably the best way to filter the wart. Okay, question from Dave. How critical is the grain steeping temperature? Uh, depends on what you're steeping. Uh, if you're steeping something like crystal malts or roasted malts, um, those won't really have um, any sort of enzymes, uh, you know, to really, you're steeping those for, you know, flavor and aroma. But if you're steeping something like maybe a Munich malt, um, Vienna malt, something like that, um, I think your uh, mashing, your, your steeping temperature would be a little bit more important because that's going to have uh, the, you want those starches in that grain to break down. So it really depends what you're steeping, especially malts like crystal malts and roasted malts are less important than something like a Munich, uh, a Vienna malt, something like that. Okay. And Elizabeth uh, from Somerville is sliding in here again, two questions. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, she's wondering if you have any suggestions for what to do with leftover yeast from brewing. She's asking if you've ever made Skeeter pee. I don't even know what that is, or bread. Um, you probably could use it for bread. Um, anytime I left over yeast, I would either dump it or um, you could save it and use it in another batch. Um, I don't really know what Skeeter pea is, but um, I do imagine you could use it for bread um, if you had all that stuff ready to go. What do you do with it? Uh, normally, uh, I would reuse it for another batch of beer or dump it. How, how many times can you use it? Um, I'd say depending on the yeast strain, but you could probably use it up to like eight to 10 times. Oh, but you're saying you might, in your operation, you might get rid of it after one? Uh, for home brewing, uh, it, it depends, you know, oh, that's I a lot see. of beer okay. to drink. If, if you're, if you're using it, you know, eight times, that's a lot of, it's a lot of beer to get through, but, uh, right. <laughs> here at, here at, here at Hopsters. Yeah. We'll reuse our yeast like six, seven, eight times. Okay. Um, here's a question from anonymous. Uh, do they make glass carboys with a wide mouth as a secondary tank fermenter? It is so hard, Anonymous says, to clean out the traditional carboy with the na narrow neck. Hmm. Yeah, I'm not sure if I've actually seen glass carboys that had wide mouths. Um, I know they have like the, uh, the hard uh, plastic or the polycarbonate ones. Um, those do have the wide mouths. Now, he's, what he's talking about, it's maybe a hole like that big. And then you have to like stick a brush in there and scrub it out. It's a little bit tough. Whereas the wide mouse, they're a little bit bigger. You can get your arm in there with like a soft sponge or something to help clean it out. Um, can't say I've seen a glass one with a wide mouth, but uh, not to say they're not out there. I've just never seen one personally. Do you have any idea how, whenever this, whenever beer was created, how they'd stumble on that? Do you know? I, not exactly sure. Uh, they said, you know, some speculate that it was actually beer that started the agricultural revolution versus uh, making bread. So, you know, it's like what came first, the chicken or the egg? Um, <laughs> the bread or the beer? Yeah. You know, yeah. If bread came first, then I'm sure some rainwater got in their, you know, 
little clay pot that had that was our malt storage and then fermented. I'm I'm sure that's probably how it started. All right, and and uh, I just have a final question. This is the uh, piece de resistance. Um, what is with brewers and the beards? I just I have to know. I know one. I have seen one brewer, a friend of mine, is the only brewer I've ever seen without a big beard. They're great. Don't get me yeah, wrong. I, I'm I, just I, wondering. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, I can speak from experience here. Uh, yeah, I'm not really sure what it is, uh, but it, it's pretty pretty common. Um, I used to work with a guy who didn't have a beard, and we all bust his chops. Be like, why, why don't you grow a beard already? <laughs> uh, I'm not really sure what it is, but uh, yeah, it's pretty common. <laughs> it's just a thing. Do, just do a you thing. guys, when you when you get together, the competitions about the beard, do you have competitions about the beards too? Uh, you know, occasionally we would. <laughs> and then after a while, you know, if you're getting close to a foot long, you know, then you're like, oh, is it going to get caught in equipment? Then you got to like, all right, let's, <laughs> let's not get ahead of ourselves here. That's terrific. Um, Quickly, Christian, we'll come back in just a moment. I want to uh, reintroduce my colleague, Sarah. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you doing, Aaron? Good, thanks. Learning yeah, lots. Good. I know. I feel like I've learned so much about home brewing today. Um, I'm a little also, thirsty. Yeah, go for it. I also want to thank everyone so much for tuning into our event this afternoon. Now more than ever, it's crucial to stay informed of what is happening in the world, and your backing helps us provide information you can trust along with events you can enjoy. And today, when you make a gift of $5 a month on our sustainer plan, you can choose to receive this 89.7 WGBH Pilsner glass. Show you're a fan of GBH in public media when you pull out this 89.7 glass and in the process, help us continue to produce content like Ask the Expert. All it takes is $5 a month or $60 all at once. And to do so, go to wgbh.org slash support events. Make a donation and receive this glass as a, to as a token of our thanks. To make it easy for you, we actually just drop the link in the chat and go ahead and click on that wherever it is on your screen. Anyway, back to you, Aaron. Thank you, Sarah. Um, as I said, I have, it's it's after lunchtime, right? I have an ale here. What glass should I use for this? Unfortunately, I, I meant to get your a beer from you, but I wasn't able to make it to Newton. So what kind of, ink, what kind of ale you got there? It's a brown ale. Okay. Um, so what they, the right they make something, yeah, for something like that, it's called a, um, an, an English pint glass or more called a uh, nonic pint. So it kind of looks like your standard shaker glass, but it has a, um, like sort of like a uh, bulbous area, yeah, like right. right before it hits the top. Uh -huh. um, that'd probably be what I would, you know, drink a brown ale out of. All right. That's the one glass I don't have. So I'll, <laughs> I'll put the beer Darn. away for the moment. <laughs> <laughs> Christian Mosbach from Hopsters Brew, www.hopstersbrew.com. Uh, check them out in Newton and in uh, the seaport. The beer is fantastic. Uh, and Christian, thank you so much for joining us here at GBH for Ask the Expert. Glad to be here. Thank you. And remember, you can, uh, if you want to start out brewing beer, you can do it at Hopsters at their uh, location on the seaport or just cruise by and get a beer. It's great stuff. <laughs> Thank you guys. Thanks everyone. Thank you.